Today we're going to discuss rotational energy and angular momentum. Okay. At the end of this section, there are no exercises for you to do. Okay. The reason for that is that at the end of section eight, which is a continuation of this lecture, okay, where we'll be talk talking about torque, okay, um, there'll be exercises where you'll have to do stuff associated with this. But it's all part of the same problem. Okay. So there are no exercises at the end of this thing. That doesn't mean that you don't have to come to the tutorials, okay? Because during the tutorials, we're going to do a little experiment to show you how to calculate moment of inertia of a pulley or a crankshaft, okay? I don't know whether those of you who have a tutorial in 1N52, okay? You may have noticed at the back of the room there is a crankshaft from an engine, okay? And what we're going to do during the tutorial sessions, whether you're with me, Rachel, or uh, Neil, okay, um, is you'll be uh, working out what I is, what the moment of inertia is for that crankshaft. And today we're going to talk about what it is, what is I, okay, and we'll also discuss angular momentum, okay, which is perhaps a little non-intuitive. But first off, well, that's, so that's what we're going to cover, okay, a review of some uh, conventions that you should all know, okay, talk about rotational energy and moment of inertia, we've got some examples, okay, and then we'll talk about angular momentum, definition, angular momentum of a disk and examples of uh, how to apply angular momentum. Right, first off, conventions, okay? This is a disk that's spinning, okay? If we want to look at displacement, we use the value theta, okay? If we want to look at um, angular velocity, we use this value omega, okay? And angular acceleration, we use this value alpha, okay? Units are generally radians per second, okay? Or radians, obviously that's for theta. For omega, we use radians per second. And for alpha, we use radians per second squared, okay? We've got a disk with a radius r, okay? And we can relate um, theta, omega, and alpha, and r with the tangential velocity. So if we look at point P specifically, okay, look at point P specifically, we have uh, we have this relationship. For point P, we have, so the um, tangential displacement of, of P, which we call X, is going to be the radius multiplied by the rotational displacement, okay? The same relationship with, with the velocity, the tangential velocity, is going to be the radius multiplied by the rotational velocity. And likewise, the angular, sorry, the tangential acceleration is going to be the angular, sorry, the angular acceleration multiplied by the radius, okay? So these, this stuff you should all know, okay? It's all elementary stuff. If you want more details, you can visit the revision notes on Blackboard, okay? Because there's a section on rotational motion. And obviously, using these relationships, okay, all those equations for constant acceleration and, in fact, non-uniform acceleration can be used in the rotational sense knowing these relationships, okay? So, for example, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS, or you can say omega 1 squared equals omega 0 squared plus 2 um, alpha uh, theta, okay? It's the same equation, just with different terms. Now, Let's look at another spinning disk, okay? And we'll look at rotational kinetic energy. Now, what I've done with this disk is I've got this little element, okay, of mass mi. The disk is mass m. This is mi, okay? And if we look at the tangential velocity of that element, okay, then it's traveling at vi, okay? We all know that. That's very simple. We've got the radius to that from the center is ri, okay? The radius of the disk itself is r, and the disk is spinning at omega radians per second. Now, we all know that the kinetic energy of that thing there, the tangential kinetic energy, one half mv squared. We covered that last week. You've got, you've got the mass and you've got the velocity. You can work out what the kinetic energy is, uk. And so, we can see that the, the kinetic energy of that element is that. Okay. Now, what I've done here is I've replaced vi okay, with r omega, ri omega, and then notice the lack of subscript 
omega i because omega, it doesn't matter where you are on this disk, the rotational velocity is always going to be omega. Okay? The tangential velocity obviously changes depending on the radius, but if you're here, obviously the tangential velocity is, is close to zero. If you're on the edge, the tangential velocity is at the maximum. But omega is the same here and the same here, and the same anywhere else. So that's why there's no i subscript down here. Okay? And so we have the kinetic energy of that element. Now, how do we work out the kinetic energy of the whole disk? Well, what you need to do is you need to add up. Basically, you, you divide this whole disk into smaller elements, and you add them all together, and that will give you the kinetic energy for the whole disk. And so we've got the sum of all the elements. Okay, well, here's uk of the disk. So the kinetic energy of the disk is the sum from i equals 1 to m, okay, of 1 half mi times ri omega squared, or that term squared, okay? So if we said omega, we know is a constant. That's not changing. And so if we bring omega squared out of the front and the 2, obviously that's a constant. We're left with this term here, the sum of mi ri squared, okay? And this term, the sum, is known as i, which is the second, which is the moment of inertia for a rotational body. If you break any body that you take, okay, I'll take my calculator, I'm spinning it around an axis, okay, if I break this calculator into small and small bits, okay, I know I can work out the moment of inertia by breaking it down, I know the mass of each of those small bits, and I know the radius they are from the centre, okay. Now obviously things like disks, they're very easy to work out. Other objects, I don't know, like a, a triangular piece of metal or a, this mouse that somebody's left, okay, they're much more difficult to work it out, but we'll, I'll show you how to do that. And so what we can do is we can then substitute the moment of inertia into the kinetic energy equation. We end up with one-half I omega squared. I omega squared. One-half I omega squared. It's the kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy for a disk. Now, so like I said, moments of inertia, they can be a little challenging to calculate, okay? If you've got something that's got a very complex shape, you need to work out, you know, like I said, you need to break it down into small bits, okay? Measure the radius from those small bits and measure the mass of those small bits, and you can generally get a good estimate of what I is. Now, there are obviously some uniform objects that um, we can work, out, work it out. We worked it out there for a disk. That was very easy to work it out, okay? And if you look in any dynamic textbook, you'll find tables of moments of inertia for, for some objects, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through um, some of those objects. I don't remember these moments of inertia. I looked them up as well, so it's perfectly fine for you to, okay? Um, but you may end up remembering some of them at least anyway. The units for moments of inertia are kilogram meters, meters squared, okay? Obviously, in the previous example, we saw that uh, that's m r squared, okay? Omega is radians per second, okay? Um, but that i term is just m r squared, so that's meters, obviously, and meters squared, and mass is obviously in kilograms. So that's where that comes from. And then if an object comprises multiple components, okay, so say I've got a bicycle wheel that's spinning, it's got a hub, and it's got a rim, those things have moments of inertia, you just add them together, okay? So I have the moment of inertia of the hub, moment of inertia of the rim, and you add them together, and you get the total moment of inertia of the wheel. Obviously, with a bicycle wheel, there are also spokes, which also have a moment of inertia, but they're generally a lot smaller compared to the moment of inertia of, say, the rim with a tire on the end. Okay, so for a solid disk, I'm going to do some little drawings, okay? With a mass m and radius r, we know the moment of inertia is mr squared. So a solid disk, obviously that looks something like this, okay? And it's going through an axis around here, which and it's spinning at omega, say, okay? Then obviously we've got a radius, this distance here, there's your r, okay? And obviously the mass is m. And so the moment of inertia is one half m r squared. Quite simple, okay? We worked that out previously. How do I get rid of this? Okay, so that's of the disk. We have the moment of inertia for a sphere, okay? So again, we've got a sphere. So this could be the Earth, say. Uh, let's have a pen. Earth. There's our axis. There's its spin, omega. It's got a mass here and a radius. 
there, then the moment of inertia for a sphere is what two fifths m r squared. Okay. For a thin ring, now what do I mean by a thin ring? Well, essentially, what I mean by a thin ring, let's say we've got a, um, let's say we've got something like this. Okay. And the thin ring has no centre, okay? Again, we've got a, a spin axis that's through the centre. There's omega. There's distance r. And the thin ring has a mass m. And basically, we define a thin ring. What's the difference between this and a disc without the disc in the, without, uh, with a hole in the middle? Well, basically, a thin ring is where the mass, uh, sorry, where the, where the thickness of this is much, much smaller compared to the radius, Okay. So say you've got a, thin, a disc of two millimetres, but the radius is a metre, that's small enough for it to be considered to be a thin ring because that, mi that millimetre or two millimetre difference is very, very small, okay? There's a difference between that and the... If you had a disc with a hole in the middle, obviously you take the moment of inertia of the disc, you take the moment of inertia of the hole, and you subtract one from the other to get that, okay? But that's the same thing here. So that's for a, uh, a thin ring. Okay, and then a rod, length L, mass M. Well, here's my rod. Oops. Okay, here's the centre of the rod. Here's my, here's my axis of spin. Okay, so it's spinning around like this. Okay, we know the length is L. We know the mass is M. And the, the moment of inertia of that rod is 1 12th ML squared. Very simple. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things, a couple of theorems that will help you determine moments of inertia, okay, for when you've got a bit more of a challenging problem, okay. The first is what's known as the parallel axis theorem. Now, here we've got our disk that's spinning about z, the axis z, okay, radius r, mass m. We know that the moment of inertia for that disk is going to be one half mr squared, okay. We all know that. That's the standard equation. And that's when it's rotating about z. Now, let's say I drill a hole in the side of that disk, okay right at the edge, and I start to spin the disc around that axis, which we know is Z, which I've called Z prime, okay? And that's distance H away, and we know that Z prime, because of the way I've drilled the hole in the middle, is parallel to axis Z, okay? Parallel axis. And the theorem states that we can work out the moment of inertia of any point on this disc, as long as that axis is parallel to the original one, and that's by using this simple formula, okay? So there's the moment of inertia of the disk when it's rotating about Z. When it's rotating about Z prime, we take the moment of inertia rotating about the Z multiplied by the mass times by the distance between those two points squared, okay? MH squared. So for any point on this disk, I could drill a hole anywhere, okay? And if I know that that hole, that axis is going to be parallel to the z axis, okay, then I can work out the moment of inertia anywhere on that disk, okay, using the parallel axis theorem, which is this theorem here. The second thing is what's called the radius of gyration, okay. What's the radius of gyration? Well, basically, for an object that's very complicated, okay, we'll do, we'll do an example of this in a moment, you may not be able to work out analytically what the moment of inertia is, okay. But what's often given it will be the radius of gyration. So, for example, this crankshaft that we've got, okay, you're actually going to be working out I um, experimentally. But say you had a crankshaft and you, um, and you wanted to know something that used I, okay, so, for example, the kinetic energy, you might be given the radius of gyration. And what that essentially says is that the radius of gyration is the moment of inertia divided by the mass. Okay, so I equals mk squared is the other way of writing it, okay? And it's, it's the radius at which the total mass of a body may be considered to be concentrated without affecting its moment of inertia, okay? Now, one example I didn't give you, oh, I, did, did, I didn't give you, no, I didn't give you, is the example of a mass on the end of a string, okay? You have a, a mass on the end of a string and I'm spinning it round, okay? The moment of inertia is going to be the weight of that mass, assuming the string is negligible mass, it's the weight of that mass multiplied by the length of the string, Okay? mr squared. And so that's essentially what you're doing is you've taken this crankshaft, you've made it into a, a really small mass, okay, that weighs the same as that crankshaft, 
and it's at the length of L along that string, okay? And that, that length is going to be K. It's essentially a way of simplifying a very complicated problem into something that a moment of inertia we know is IK squared. And like I said, we'll deal with this in a second. <coughs> in fact, we'll deal with it now. So, page 105 in your notes. Visualizer, come on. Oh, it needs to be on, doesn't it? It is on. Ah, da, da, da. Um. Oh, that's off. Let's go on. Uh, ah, success. Right. So this is page 105 in your notes. 105. Okay. We've got three little problems that I'm going to run through quite quickly. So... It says the rim of a steel pulley wheel, okay, so this is just the rim, it's 120 millimetres wide, 20 millimetres thick, with a mean diameter of 1.4 metres. Considering the pulley as a thin ring and neglecting the mass of the hub and the spokes, calculate the moment of inertia of the pulley. Okay, we've been given the density. Now we know the mass of an object, okay, is going to be the density multiplied the, by the volume, okay. And we know the volume of this ring, if I had the ring here, Okay, we've got a thickness here, that's T. We've got a width here, I'll call that W. And obviously the length of the ring is going to be pi times the diameter, okay? Because it's obviously if you cut the ring, peeled it open, that would be the length of the ring. That's the circum circumference of the disc. Okay, so we know this is going to be rho times by the width multiplied by the thickness multiplied by pi multiplied by the diameter. And so if we go through, that's going to be 7, 8, 5, 0. The width we know is 0 0.12. The thickness we know is 0 0.02, because we're dealing in metres, remember, times by pi, times by 1.4. 1.4. OK? And that comes out to be 82.86. Kilograms, OK? The moment of inertia for a thin ring, we know that's going to be mr squared. So that's going to be 82.86 multiplied by 0 0.7 squared. We use 0 0.7 because that's half the diameter. We're dealing with radius now. OK. And you do the sums, and that should come out to be 40.6 kilograms meter squared. Okay? <coughs> Easy peasy. Now, next question. If the steel ring is calculated in Q1, if it's spun at 3,000 RPM, what is its rotational kinetic energy? Okay, well, we worked out... Kinetic energy for a rotating object, one half I omega squared. Okay? So we've got one half times by 40.6. Okay? Now omega in this case, omega is 3000 revs per minute. We know in one minute we have 60 seconds. And in one revolution we have two pi radians. Revolutions cancel, minutes cancel. We end up with 3,000 times by 2 pi divided by 60. And that comes out to be 314.16 squared. And so we end up getting 2 megajoules, or 2 times 10 to the 6 joules. OK? So that's our... Kinetic energy, so that if we have that thin disc, okay, that weighs 82 kilograms, it's a big mama, 1.4 metres in diameter, that's spinning at 3,000 RPM, that's containing 2 megajoules of 
energy. Okay, that's a lot of energy. Two megajoules is quite a lot of energy. <coughs> well, what about question three? This bicycle wheel. Okay, again, we've got a bicycle wheel. It's constructed of aluminium that has a certain density. We've got a wheel rim, spokes, and a hub. Let's neglect the spokes. We don't need to worry too much. But let's deal with the hub and the rim. Okay, I've got some um, numbers down here that I've guesstimated. They're not brilliant, but they're guesstimates. Okay. And essentially, it says, what is the radius of gyration? Okay, so we, we need to work out the moment of inertia. Okay, and then using the radius, the equation for radius of gyration, we can then work out the radius of gyration. Now, the moment of inertia, well, we can work out the moment of inertia of the hub, and we can work out the moment of inertia of the rim. You add them together to get the total moment of inertia. And so, first off, let's work out the mass of the hub. Okay, well, that's going to be the density times by the... Um, pi r squared times by the length, okay, so that's going to be 2700 multiplied by pi multiplied by point zero. it's 50 millimetres in diameter, so that's 025 squared multiplied by 100, so 0 0.1 and that comes out to be 0 0.5301 kilograms and so the so the moment of inertia of the hub, okay, we know the hub, we can say it's modelled as a circular disk, so we know the equation, one half mr squared, and so that's going to be one half times by 0 0.5301 times by radius squared, well that's 0 0.025 squared, and that comes out to be 1.657 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per metre squared. So there's the moment of the inertia of the hub. The mass of the rim, we do the same way, well it's going to be the, it's the same way up here, times by the width, times by the thickness, times by pi, times by the diameter. Okay, so that's going to be 2,700 times by the width, which is 0 0.1, times by the thickness, which is 0 0.01, times by the pi, times by the diameter, which I think is 700 millimetres, 0 0.7. And that comes out to be 5.94 kilograms. At which point you'd be hoping that you didn't pay too much for these rims. That's a really heavy wheel. OK, so the moment of inertia of a thin ring, we know it's mr squared. OK, so there's our m, 5.94. We know our radius. 0.35 squared, and that comes out to be 0 0.7274 kilograms per metre squared. Okay, so we've got the moment of inertia of the hub, we've got the moment of inertia of the rim, okay? To get the total moment of inertia, we need to add them together. So that's simple. I of the wheel equals... I of the hub plus the I of the rim. So that's going to be zero, uh, sorry, whoops, 1.657 times 10 to the minus 4 plus 0 0.7274. And that comes out to be 0 0.7275 kilograms meter squared. So the, the hub doesn't actually have that much influence because the, the moment of inertia of the wheel is huge, okay? And we know that the radius of gyration, k, kg squared equals i divided by the mass. Okay. And so we've got 0 0.7275 divided by the mass of those, those two. So that's those things added together. 0 0.5301 plus uh, 5.94. <coughs> which is 0 0.7275 divided by 0 .6, uh, sorry, 6 6.47 7 kilograms, okay? And so that comes out to be 0 0.112 and obviously K, kg, the root of 0 0.112 comes out to be 0 0.335 meters. There's your solution. 
So what we've done here is we've had to work out the mass of the hub, the mass of the, uh, of the rim. From those two, we can work out the moment of inertia of both of them. Okay? The moment of inertia of the wheel is everything added together, I, H plus I, R. Okay? And we know that the moment of inertia is also M, K squared, or K squared equals I divided by M. And so you take the moment of inertia, you divide it by the mass, that's the mass of both the hub and the rim, Okay, and you end up getting 0 0.0112, sorry, 0 0.112, and, uh, and kg is the square root of that, okay, because it's k squared is 0 0.112. Square root it, you get 0.335 metres. And so although the, 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 di the diameter of the wheel rim is 700 millimetres, okay, we know the radius of duration, if we took all the mass of that rim, put it into a ball, okay, the string would have to be 335 millimetres for it to have the same moment of inertia as the rim itself, okay? <coughs> Oops. Now, has everybody got that down? Have we got it down? Yeah? Okay. Oh, now, angular momentum. We all know from lecture five, okay, that you have, if you have an object and it's travelling at velocity v, it weighs mass m, we know that linear momentum is m times v, okay? That was two weeks ago, or three weeks ago even, and Neil was the chap that gave you the lecture on it, okay? P equals mv, we all know this, okay? Now, here I've got an object m, it's travelling at v, okay? And so the momentum of that object is going to be mv, okay? Now, the angular momentum of that object depends on the radius of the uh, object, uh, of the distance, and we, I'm choosing this point as point q, it's arbitrary point in space, okay? We've got a position vector, rq, between q and m, okay? And we've got the, velocity, the, the um, angular momentum of that point m is, p, is mv, now, angular momentum is defined <coughs> as R, Q, cross P, okay? Remember the cross product in lecture one? Okay, well, now we're using it. And H is what we know as the angular momentum, okay? Now, position vector R, Q, cross P, okay? Which is R, Q, cross V times by M. M is the scalar, and obviously V, M, V is, the, is P, which is our linear momentum, Okay? Now, the magnitude, we know, so what I'm saying here is you've got a vector here, RQ, okay, and that's dependent on point, point Q and point where the, M, where the mass is. If I choose a point up here, let's call that C, then obviously my position vector is going to be different. And so the important thing to think about, because we've got this equation here, your angular momentum is very, very dependent upon where you choose that point of reference to be, okay? So... If I'm seeing an object rotate, okay, it's here in the middle of the room. I don't have an object, but let's assume there is. From my point of view, the angular momentum of, that, of, the, of an object at the end of that, uh, on the edge of that disk or whatever it's rotating, is going to be different from the angular momentum you see when you're looking at that disk, okay? Because our position vectors are going to be different, okay? That's important to remember. That's the big difference between angular momentum and linear momentum. With linear momentum, you see an object move, you know its mass, you know its velocity, you're going to know its momentum. It doesn't matter where you are or where you're seeing it from. Whereas with angular momentum, it's very dependent upon that position vector RQ. It's fundamental, okay? And so angular momentum is not an intrinsic property of an object that's rotating. We know with the cross product, we can work out the magnitude. Well, that's going to be the magnitude of V times the magnitude of RQ. Obviously, we've got an M out here, so we need to include that 
times by sine of that angle between um, the position vector and the this angle here, the position vector, the direction of the position vector, and our p value, okay, which is in this direction. Now, if you remember, right-hand rule, you take the shortest angle, RQ, round to V, okay, well, that's <laughs> clockwise, okay? Clockwise, we know, is going to be, uh, is that right? No, clockwise, right-hand rule, okay? It's clockwise, so that's going to be like that, okay? So we know the vector is into the wall, okay? The vector is going into the wall, we do, obviously, we write that like this. Okay, that's quite simple to understand. And so we've got MVR, okay, so that's the, the scale of the, the uh, magnitude of those things, times by sine of alpha, okay. And R sine of alpha, well, that's going to be this value here, which I've called R perpendicular Q, okay. And so we've got the mass times by the velocity times by this radius, and that will give us our moment of inertia, the magnitude of the moment of inertia. Like I said, the direction, we use the right-hand rule, it's into the board in this case. Obviously, if I chose a point up here, point C, if I do that here, I'll do that in blue, if I chose this point here, okay, then obviously that's going to be my new R, C, okay. Now, here I've got a, if I call that alpha, okay, then I've got an anti-clockwise, and so with the blue one, okay, that's going to be out of the board. Okay? I've got something that looks like this. Okay? You have to turn anti-clockwise and you get a thing out of the board. Okay? Now, last example. What about if I had my point of reference was here? What's my magnitude of the moment of inertia, angular moment of inertia? Let's say this is my new point, okay? That's my new R value, okay? What's R cross P in that case, situation? What's the angle between those two things? If this is my R value, what's the angle? R cross P. R cross P. Well, what's the angle between that line and that line? Zero. zero. What's sine of zero? Zero. So the magnitude is going to be zero. Yeah? Okay. So based on this definition, okay, we can work out the magnitude of something that's rotating around the center, okay? So for example, let's take the situation of Earth rotating about the sun, okay? So we've got the sun is at point C. We've got um, the Earth, which is at mass M here, okay? This should be RC, not RQ, by the way, so I've changed that in your notes. Guys, can we stop the NASA, please? If you've got a question, stick up your hand, and I'm happy to answer it, okay? But chatting to each other is not the solution. And the guy with the computer at the top, the guy with the computer at the top, are you taking notes, or is that, are you doing something? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> okay. Okay, we've got the mass of the sun at the C. Okay, this should be our C. This, this is the mass of the Earth, and it's got a tangential velocity of V. Okay, now one point is at this point. Obviously, um, a few days later, it's going to be at this point. This is the Earth rotating around the sun. Okay, and what we can do is we can use this definition: R Q cross V times by M. Okay, well, what's the angle between R Q and V here? Ninety. So sine of ninety is. One, okay, and so the angular momentum of this point is just going to be mv, okay, times by uh, times by r, okay, r m m m v r, okay. Now what's the what about this one? What's the angle between r q and v here? Ninety. So what's the sine of ninety? One. So what's the momentum of what's the angular momentum of point m? 
MVR. Okay, it's the same thing. And so the, the unique thing about this is that with point C, okay, when you, when you pick the center axis, the angular momentum of any object around that is going to be the same. Okay, that's the only difference. So there we have the angular momentum is M times R cross V. Well, since R cross V is just R V, okay, basically we end up with M R V. And this is unique for a circle, okay, for a something that's rotating around a circle. And it's unique because RC, R, so RC or RQ isn't changing, okay? It doesn't matter. Although the position vector is, is changing in terms of its angle, the angle between the position vector and the tangential velocity is always constant. So that, although this is changing, it's, it's, it's not changing the angular momentum. So with a disk, we've done the same thing that we did earlier. We took an element, okay? We know that that element is accelerating. It's got a tangential velocity of vi, okay? It's mi. We know the radius from the center is ri, okay? <coughs> now, for that element, okay, we know the angular momentum is going to be m ri vi, which is what we just worked out with the Earth going around the sun, okay? Which is m r i squared times by omega, because we could replace vi with r omega, okay? You replace those things, and there you get mri c squared times by omega, knowing that vi equals r, the omega ri. Again, omega is the same for anywhere on the disk, so you don't need to worry about the subscript. Okay, and the entire angular momentum is going to be omega multiplied by the sum of m i r i squared, okay? And we saw this earlier. This it's the same as I. So we can say the momentum is I omega. Now, I don't know whether any of you are into computers, okay? And if you're, if you're old enough, I don't know whether you are, um, there was a company called I omega that made a, the zip drive, like big floppy disks, okay? That's obviously where they got their name from, I omega, rotational angular momentum, okay? I omega is angular momentum. Now, like linear momentum, angular momentum needs to be conserved, okay? You cannot get rid of angular momentum, okay? It can change, um, but, you know, it always exerts, you know, basically, every system, angular momentum is always conserved, okay? And a big example of that would be an ice skater. Now, I've got a little video to show you this. Okay, so here's my video. Here's an ice skater, okay, and you'll see when she starts spinning there, her arms are out, okay, she's spinning relatively slowly, and watch what happens, she brings her arms in, okay, which reduces her moment of inertia, and because I omega, you reduce your moment of inertia, your omega must go up, okay, and watch what happens. She brings her arms in, and suddenly she speeds up, that was 308 RPM, okay. Do you want to see that again? Replay. Moment of inertia, arms out, it's quite slow, okay? Her rotational rate, she brings them in, and because of conservation of momentum, <laughs> angular momentum, she speeds up. So because of that, that situation, you spin up with your angular momentum, okay? When you, when you reduce your moment of inertia, which she did by bringing her arms in, she sped up, okay? And so for a disk rotating about its centre of mass, we have the equation one-half I omega squared. We know that. That was from uh, kinetic energy, okay? So this is in summary. I've got an example to show you at the end, okay? So the kinetic energy of a disk rotating about the center of mass is I omega squared, okay? Parallel, parallel axis theorem. Guys, come on, please stop the natter, okay? I know if I go over, I'm working into your lunch, okay? And I want my lunch too. Right, IZ prime, okay, is a parallel axis to IZ, okay, to Z, and we know the 
the moment of inertia around Z prime is going to be the moment of inertia around the center multiplied by the distance squared and the mass, okay? Sorry. It's the moment of inertia around Z plus the distance squared times by the mass, okay? Radius of gyration, we said I equals K squared times M or I, K squared equals I divided by M, they're the same equation. And the radius of gyration is simply the radius at which if you take, took the mass of whatever it is you're rotating, you put it into a ball, you put it at the end of the string, you spin it around, that moment of inertia will be the same as the mass of your object. Angular momentum is defined as um, R cross V multiplied by the mass, okay? If Q is the center of rotation, then the magnitude of the angular momentum, okay, which is a vector, is just M R V. Or if you want to change V for R, um, R omega, then you get M R omega, R squared omega. And for a disk, okay, the angular, angular momentum of the disk we know is I omega, okay? And like linear momentum, angular momentum must be conserved if no external forces are acting upon it. Now, we've got another example here. Nine of your notes. Now, recently, Porsche developed this car. It's called the 911 or GT3 R Hybrid, okay? It's a racing 911, okay? And it competed last year at the 24 Hours of Nürburgring. And for much of it, it was winning, okay? Um, it didn't finish because it had a problem with its engine, funny enough. The hybrid system was fine. And essentially what it's doing is it's storing energy recouped from braking in a great big flywheel, okay? You've got a flywheel inside the car, okay? And it's, um, when you brake, it spins up the flywheel, stores energy, and then when you accelerate, you can redeploy that energy into the front wheels in this case, and it helps you in terms of acceleration. Gives you extra oomph, okay? It's not dissimilar from the system in, say, like a Toyota Prius, but that stores it in, a, in, a, in the battery, okay? And then you've got an electric motor. Here you've got a flywheel. And I, know, I believe that Williams Formula One team next year will be running a flywheel system as part of the, the kinetic energy recovery system. Those of you that follow Formula One, there's, there's now this uh, allowance to have a recovery system so that energy recouped under braking could be redeployed. It's exactly the same system going on here. Okay, we've got a flywheel. It spins at 40,000 RPM and can deliver 120 kilowatts for eight second burst, okay? And we want to know what is the uh, angular momentum when the flywheel is spinning and its radius of gyration, assuming the flywheel weighs 10 kilograms. So, we know that power, okay, power is energy divided by time. Okay, so we know that we've got uh, the energy is going to be the power times by the time. So that's 120 times 10 to the 3 times by 8 seconds. So we have 960 times 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, so that's the energy in the flywheel when it's spinning. 0.9 megajoules. Okay, that's a lot of energy. Now we know that the kinetic energy in a disk, UK, is one half I omega squared. And so we can rearrange this. We, this, is our, this is our UK. Okay, so we can rearrange this equation and we can say that I is going to be 2 times by UK divided by omega squared. Now omega it's 40,000 RPM revs per minute times by one minute is 60 seconds times by one revolution is 2 pi radians. Revolutions cancel, minutes cancel. 40,000 times by 2 pi divided by 60. We end up getting an omega value of 4188.8 radians per second. Okay, so we can plug that into this equation. I equals 2 times 960 times 10 to the 3 divided by 4188.8 squared. 
And that comes out to be 0 0.1094 kilometers squared. So that's our value for I. Now, what's the equation for angular momentum? It's that computer hardware company, I omega, exactly. So angular momentum, H equals I omega. And so we have I is 0 0.1094 by omega. That's 418. That's the angular momentum of 454. 58, sorry, 0.4 kilograms meters squared per second. So that's the answer to the first bit. And the other thing it asks for is the radius of gyration. So the radius of gyration, so that's the first bit, radius of gyration. And we know that the answer, kg squared, is I divided by m. OK? We've been given the mass as 10 kilograms. We've got I. We calculated that here. So that's 0 0.1094 divided by 10. And we get yep, I divided by 10. So that's going to be 0 0.01094. OK? And obviously, kg is going to be that squared, 0 0.01094. And so square root of 0 0.10 meters. And so that disk that's spinning at 40,000 RPM, okay, imagine that was the mass on the end of a string. That string would need to be 1.0, oh, sorry, 0 0.1046 metres long for that to be, have an equivalent moment of inertia as, as the disk itself, okay? So that's what we mean by radius of gyration. And so you have a disk that's spinning at 40,000 RPM. It's got, can deliver 120 kilowatts for eight seconds. So we know how much kinetic energy is stored in that disk. Because what happens is when you deploy that, obviously the disk um, is converting that uh, potential energy or the kinetic energy in the disk into uh, power that they send to the wheels of the car. Okay? By rearranging the equation for kinetic energy, we can work out what the moment of inertia is, I. Okay? And then from that, using the equation from angular momentum, I omega, we can work out the angular momentum of that disk about its center point, OK? If you've got a radius of gyration, k squared equals i divided by m, we know the mass is 10 kilograms. You take your i value, you divide it by 10, you square root that, and that will give you your radius of gyration. <coughs>